Well, good morning again. This morning, I, I would like to talk with you about what is the spirit of Christmas. Uh, to begin with, I, I think it's, you know, we, we need to just explore um, when, when the subject of the spirit of Christmas comes up, uh, what, what exactly does that mean? You know, it's going to come as no surprise that um, for each person, the spirit of Christmas can have a, a different meaning. Uh, certainly for Scrooge, the spirit of Christmas was a ghost. Um, the liquor industry will say that the spirit of Christmas um, is found in a, in a bottle and they spend millions of dollars to, to promote that. Some people feel like the spirit of Christmas is sending cards. Um, and, and as a result, Americans send billions of, of Christmas cards every year. Some people feel that the spirit of Christmas is the joy and the happiness of gathering together family and, and meeting with, with people together in, in a, a sense of, um, you know, just a, a warm closeness. Other people, Christmas isn't a, a happy thing at all. It's a, it's a sad spirit. Uh, Earl Weiler wrote this, Christmas is a bitter day for mothers who are poor. The wistful eyes of children are daggers to endure. Though shops are crammed with playthings, but not for everyone. If a mother's purse is empty, there might as well be none. My purse is full of money, but I cannot buy a toy, only a wreath of holly for the grave of my little boy. That's bringing a crowd down quick, isn't it? Um, you know, so so Christmas for some people is just really a, a a sad time of year. There there's a lot of heavy thought that's associated with it. But without a doubt, the most common response when people are asked what is the spirit of Christmas, um, the most people say the spirit of Christmas is giving. And that seems to make a lot of sense. But may I suggest that all of the all of these ideas that I just um, mentioned, all of them are wrong. I'm going to show you that the true spirit of Christmas um, is, is found in in the the words here in Luke chapter one and in Luke chapter two. Let's begin by looking at a, a woman we talked a little bit of, I talked a little bit about her last week, um, Elizabeth. Remember, Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, and she was told, you know, she had never been able to have children. She and her husband were, were well beyond childbearing years, and yet she was able, uh, she was told by the angel that uh, she was going to bear John the Baptist, that she, you know, that she was going to give birth to him. And in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 40, it says, she entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. That's speaking of Mary. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Now, what was the response here of Elizabeth in anticipation of the birth of Christ? She, she used the word blessed repeatedly. Uh, she, she was excited and, and began to be worshipful toward God because of the greeting of, the, the, of Mary. And, and, and so as a result, uh, she, she is celebrating what God is doing. Another important individual is her husband, Zacharias. And in verse 67 of chapter 1, Zacharias um, is, is being informed 
and he, it says, Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He sent us a mighty Savior. Now, his response is identical to that of his wife. Um, you know, they both are blessing God. They're both celebrating God. And, and, and so their response to the, um, to the announcement of the baby is one of, of excitement, one of, of blessing. Now... In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, the angels appear to the shepherds. And it, in verse 13, it says, Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those to whom God is pleased. So we have... Elizabeth and we have Zacharias and they're praising and worshiping God. Now at the announcement to the, the shepherds, the response is one of praising and glorifying God. Uh, it, it's the same that Zacharias did and it's the same that Elizabeth did. What about the shepherds? Well, what was their reaction? They came and they saw Mary and Joseph and the baby. And in Luke um, chapter 2, verse 20, it says, The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just like the angel had told them. So what we are seeing is that every time the announcement or, or the uh, of of Christ is is mentioned, there's worship that is going on. the The response to the birth of Jesus is worship. And, and that's that's critical. That's that's a very important thing for us to understand. Um, when Mary and Joseph brought the child to Jesus, when they brought Jesus to the temple, um, Simon took Jesus. There was an, uh, an old man who had been promised that he would not die until he uh, saw the, God's salvation. And what does he do? He blesses God. He praises God. And then Anna, who is a prophetess, who was living there in the temple, when she sees Jesus, uh, in verse 38, she came along, and just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph, she began praising God. So every person, every situation that comes up that has to do with the birth of Jesus results in people worshiping God. It results in people thanking God, celebrating God, because He is providing salvation for, for humanity. Now, I, I think that it's pretty obvious then that the spirit of Christmas is one of worship, that, that that should be at the heart of our celebration of, of the birth of Jesus is one of worship because we're, we, are, we are better because we have been given this gift of salvation. You know, as wonderful as family and friends are and food and gifts and, and all of those sort of things, those don't hold a candle to the, uh, the joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, remember when the wise men came um, in Matthew chapter 2, they said, we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. That was why the Magi came all of the way over was in order to worship him. Now, if Christmas is a time for anything, it needs to be a time for worship. Worship is an attitude. And, and I'm going to spend the, the rest of my message here dealing with what does worship look like? What, how, how does worship look in, in real life? Now, 
Um, it, we, we've, I, I've, I've skipped over. I, I need to come clean. I don't feel good. And so I'm, I'm doing the best I can today. Um, I, I can't give an excuse every other Sunday, but this Sunday, if, if ever there's a time when, when you're, you're, when we should be overflowing with praise, when we should be overflowing with worship, it should be during the Christmas season. Now, I left out Mary, and, and let's just look at her, because I want to spend a few minutes looking at, at her response. In Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 46, Mary responds, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. And then she launches into one of the most beautiful um, psalms of worship that you will find anywhere in the New Testament. It's called the Magnificat. And, and it's just a, a, from her heart, a praise of God. And, and she's just pouring out her soul in the, in the, with nothing but gratitude for God. And, and so her, her heart is just filled with praise. And in verse 47, she says, How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Notice that. This is important because she is bearing Jesus. You know, she, she, she has this child growing within her and she's not excited just because she's pregnant with this child, but she's, she's excited because he represents salvation. And that's, that's the key that we don't want to lose. That that's the key that you have to have to have. If, if, our connection to Jesus isn't because of salvation, then we've missed the point. You know, we don't want to get so wrapped up in cute little baby Jesus, you know, lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. That, that's great. But the point is that he is salvation. Now, in verses 46 and 47, Mary responds, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Two things, my soul praises and my spirit rejoices. Now, the first thing that I'd like you to, to notice and understand is that worship is an attitude that is born in, inside us. It's not something that happens external. Worship is something that happens internal. We, we need to understand that because too often we think that worship is something that takes place in here. And, and it's not. Worship is something that takes place in, in our hearts. Spirit and soul speak of their, our inner being. You know, it's, it's, something that is born of our mind, of our emotion, of our will. True worship swells from within us. It's not an external thing whatsoever. Worship is not stained glass windows or, or sermons or reading the Bible or any of those things. Those, those can obviously be aids that, that help, but worship it takes place in our hearts, in, in our spirits, in, in, in our innermost being. And, and it's so critical that we, we understand that. Worship is the spontaneous response of us to what God is doing. And it's not a calculated thing. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, it says, This people draw near me with their mouth. They draw near me with their lips. They do, um, they do honor me. Now, that sounds like a, a good thing, like worship. But it goes on and says, But have removed their hearts far from me. What this is saying is, is that you can worship or you can go through the motions of worship, 
but your heart may not be in it. And if your heart's not in it, then, then God's saying, you haven't worshipped me. He's saying that we cannot be superficial. We cannot be shallow. Jesus said, God is a God of spirit in John 4, 24. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So true worship is worship that comes from inside of us. David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there is any wickedness in, in me. You know, again, that, that's the attitude of worship is that I, I want you to look inside me, God, and clean out anything that would stand in the way. Secondly, it's inter okay, it's internal, but it's also intense. Notice the, the word she uses magnifies in verse 46. When, when she says that she magnifies the Lord, what she means is that she's exalting, that she's glorifying, that, that, she's, that she's throwing herself into the worship of God. It's loud. It, it's, it's done with a, a sense of, of enthusiasm, with, with vigor. You know, she, she doesn't just kind of say, well, gee, God, thank you very much. I, I really do wish, you know, that, that you're, you would bless me. That, that's not what's happening. She's, she is saying, God, God, thank you. Oh, praise you, God. You know, and, and she's throwing herself into it. And then there's the word rejoices in verse 47, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And again, there, there's this attitude of intensity. Um, it, it's this attitude of being overjoyed. So Mary is not just saying a few nice thoughts. She's, she's giving herself completely throwing herself into the 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 whole worship it, it's a it, it it's coming up from her heart but she is giving everything that she is to it she's bursting from inside with this intense overwhelming um, praise and worship there's nothing shallow about it there's nothing superficial about it so worship is an attitude it, it's it's a frame of mind and and it's born out of out of our hearts in John 424 Jesus said do you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth so what this means is that that when we're worshiping God God, it's we we're connecting with God on a on a spiritual level. We're not worshiping Him um, just with our mouths, and it springs from a heart that is overjoyed. My question is: When was the last time you have allowed yourself to be? surprised by God, to be overjoyed by your relationship with God. You know, ha have you ever um, recently been reading the Bible and all of a sudden just the words jump off the, the pages to you and you find yourself just worshiping God, saying, God, you are so wonderful. I, I can't believe that you, you would love me. And, and I just, I thank you for who you are. You know, th that's, that's that just simple honesty is something that, that, um, is is a genuine way of worshiping. You know, honestly, most of us don't respond that way. We we have become cold and indifferent, really, to the the blessings of God. Most of what we get excited about are material things, or some promotion we've gotten, or or something like that. God doesn't want superficial worship. Uh, if it isn't internal, and if it isn't intense, then, then God says, why are, you, why are you doing this? Thirdly, it, it is also a habitual habit. You know, it, it's, it's internal, it's intense, but it's also habitual. Verse 46 says, my soul 
continually magnifies the Lord. In other words, this was a way of life for her. It was continual. It was ongoing. And I think that this is an important insight. To be honest, uh, most of us only worship when things are going well with us. And, and we think, you know, uh, well, if, if life's not good, I, I'm not worshiping then, or, or we just don't worship. But the, the fact is that we are to worship all the time. If you go through life and all you do is thank God when life is going good, then um, that that's not really worship. That that's that's not honest. That you know God is God and He should be worshipped regardless. The Bible says, "In everything, give thanks." It's the idea that you are so utterly lost in the wonder of God, that no matter what happens, you, you just, you praise God, you worship God. Paul said in Philippians 1.20, my goal in life is that Christ may be magnified through me, whether by life or death. Now, there's a fourth element to pro proper attitude of worship, um, and, and that's that we are humble. Worship is to be internal, it's to be intense, it's to be habitual, and it's to be humble. Now, verse 48 says, For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. Mary is overwhelmed by the fact that God chose her. You know, he, he picked her out and said, I'm going to use you. And she was just blown away by that. You know, the, the, the thing is, pride stands in the way of us properly worshiping God because pride competes with God. Most of us too often are, are too proud. And, and as a result, we, we focus on ourselves. We only look at, at our own wants and our own needs. And if we're happy, it's because we've gotten what we want. And then we get sad because somebody has messed up our, our little world. Pride is always competing with God, and pride will always crush or, or ruin worship. Worship is born out of a humble heart. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, it, it, it's the empty people the, the hurting people, the people that know that they are, are, are worthless, if you will, that, that are overwhelmed by God's grace because God has loved them and God has, has given them salvation. And, and that's, that's where we need to find ourselves. Not that we're so high and mighty and proud, but just the opposite, that we recognize that we're meek and lowly and that we don't have our acts together. And so as a result, we cry out to God and say, God, help me. I, I can't do this. Now, people who have a hard time worshiping are the people who think that they deserve the good life. And that's all they're interested in is more of the good life. But remember, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Now, what do we worship for? You know, in verse 49, it says, For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. In other words, God is so incredible and he is absolutely holy, and yet he chooses to do good for us, and even though we are unholy. And, and that was Mary's thing. You know, that, that was why her mind was kind of blown, was just, you know, God, how, how would you choose me? When we begin to worship, when we really begin to understand from the depths of our hearts, all that God has done to redeem us, 
That's where real praise and worship begins. You know, you, you can't effectively praise and worship God unless you get the fact that He has redeemed you. He has saved you. And that's why Mary is praising, praising God here, is because He is her Savior. You know, how, how tragic it is that we have become indifferent. You know, how, how tragic that we get upset about things that, because life didn't go the way we think it should have gone. And so we get a bitter spirit. Instead of going through life with a worshipful heart, uh, w w instead we, we walk around with a bad attitude. You know, she, Mary, can't believe that a holy God would reach down and redeem, let alone allow her to be the mother of the Redeemer. And so she just worships God and, and her praise just comes out of this pure adoration, this pure gratitude for God's gift of salvation. So how are we to worship God? We are to worship Him in spirit. We are to worship Him intensely. We are to worship Him habitually. And we are to worship Him with a heart of humility. And who do we worship? We worship God, our Savior. Because it is the gift of salvation that Christmas is all about. Now that that's what the spirit of Christmas is. It is a it is a spirit of worship. It is a spirit of celebrating God's salvation. Nothing less is good enough as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, I come before you this, this morning, and I just ask for your guidance and leadership. I pray that as each person here is in a, an attitude of prayer, I pray that you will help each of us, Lord, to just honestly look at our lives and ask ourselves, am I, am I worshiping you correctly? Am I giving you my best? Am I turning my life over to you, allowing you to be in control? Father, I pray that each person here would honestly and openly just allow you access into their lives and that they would open their hearts and their minds. Father, we need you. Each and every day we need you. And I thank you for the gift of salvation and the fact that you have given us this, this privilege to be able to call you Father. And I just ask that if there's any person that's a part of this service who doesn't know you, who doesn't have a relationship with you, that you will draw them to yourself and open their hearts and their minds so that they turn their lives over to you completely. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.